Well, it's a great privilege today to welcome Professor Sir Colin Humphreys, who is Professor of Material Science in the Material Science Department in the University of Cambridge. So my name is Colin Humphreys, and my research involves three main activities. One is using big electron microscopes, where I look at individual atoms in materials and try and explain the strength of the materials, their electrical properties by what the atoms are doing. And Professor Humphreys has been engaged for many decades in the study of the materials that make up our world and sometimes uh, explaining their wonderful properties, sometimes making new materials that have very amazing and exotic properties. Another thing is I work with Rolls-Royce and we're developing materials for next generation jet engines which will consume a lot less fuel. And the third thing I do is to work with a new material called gallium nitride which is going to be the next generation lighting which will save lots of energy. These bulbs will last for 60 years of normal use and really be high quality lighting. So, you know, your skin tones, lipstick colours and so on look the same indoors as outdoors. At the same time, uh, Professor Humphreys is very interested in the subject of miracles because as a Christian he would like to relate his uh, belief in miracles to his own uh, scientific work and his own scientific endeavours. So I'm delighted that we can now hear what Prof Professor Humphreys uh, thinks about some of these really uh, challenging and interesting questions. So my name is Colin Humphreys, I'm Professor of Material Science in Cambridge University and um, I'm here today to talk about science and the possibility of miracles. So let me start by showing you this spring which looks like an ordinary spring so if you stretch it you may better see it just goes back but maybe I'll pass this to you and ask you just to stretch it just a bit further. Um, maybe just... So this spring is now properly ruined but this, this, is, this metal has a memory, and what triggers a memory is heat. So if you like to hold this, um, and I've got a hairdryer here. And this is just a piece of wire which has been told that it should be straight. And so if you bend this around, into this sort of shape, any sort of shape. So it remembers its shape. And this can be quite useful because I don't know if you've ever had someone around for coffee and they stayed a bit too long and you sort of want to politely get rid of them. Well, for their coffee spoon you just give them this and when they put it into their coffee that's what so. <laughs> I should tell you, right, the science behind this is quite complicated, but basically the material has a different crystal structure, that's a different arrangement of atoms at a higher temperature and a lower temperature. And so when you go from the, from the uh, l lower temperature to the higher temperature, it changes its structure, that changes the arrangement of atoms, right? And these are called shape memory metals. They're actually, you, they're very useful. Someone who's uh, got an artery w w which is closed up, um, then people, the first operation is to have a stent usually and what happens is the surgeon at a convenient place inserts a plastic tube into that artery and then he, he inserts it towards where the, where the blockage is, there's a little balloon on the end and he blows into this effectively and, 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 and expands the, uh, the artery and then puts in a shape memory metal which is squeezed up and when it's uh, in cold saline solution so it's kept cold and then when the hot blood comes in it just expands and just keeps that artery open so that's one of the uses of these materials. So so this is an example of wonders of science, um, almost like miracles of science. And now let me tell you about miracles which are sort of false miracles, because uh, you need to be aware of false miracles. And uh, this shape some of you may have seen, but this shape has been found in witch doctors, um, I don't know what you call them, witch doctors packs if you like, You're going back, not just modern witch doctors but going back hundreds and hundreds of years and carved out a bone if you go back in time and so the witch doctors today will have them carved back a bone and so let's say some person is brought to the witch doctor and um, uh, accused of some crime and then maybe the witch doctor is bribed or maybe doesn't like the person, does like the person, if he likes the person he'll say let's just spin this, spin this bone and if it spins like that then he says the person is innocent but if it turns back on itself, like that, he says the person's guilty. Right? 
So, that, so you've got to be aware of, as it were, false miracles. And so if you're a scientist thinking about miracles, you don't leave your science behind. You, know, you, you still think of miracles in a scientific sort of way. And I think there's two sorts of miracles you find in the Bible. You find those miracles in which God is working in, with, and through nature. So no scientific laws are broken at all, and scientists really shouldn't have any problems with these sorts of miracles. Um, and what, they, what makes them a miracle is just the timing, the special timing. And one of, an example of this is one of the best-known Old, Old Testament miracles. That's the crossing of the Red Sea, where the Bible actually says, the book of Exodus says, the Lord sent a strong east wind which blew all night and blew the waters back. So we're actually told the mechanism is this strong wind which is operating on the water and blowing the water back. And if this was filled to the brim with water and I blew across here, then I would blow water off the other side because the force of my breath would actually force the water across. It's just the stress of my breath on the surface of the water. And if um, a strong wind acts uh, at the seaside, for example, it will force the water back from the shore. And if it acts for a long time, several hours, uh, it can force the water back for hundreds of yards on a sloping seashore, which has been observed a number of times, and wrecks have been you know, discovered, shipwrecks, which have been underwater normally. So that's one sort of miracle. And another example of that sort of miracle in the Old Testament is the crossing of the River Jordan. And I'm not sure if you will remember this story, but um, uh, the story was that the Israelites were on one side, they'd been wandering in the wilderness for about 40 years, they're on one side of the River Jordan, the Promised Land was on the other side of the River Jordan, they wanted to get across, and the River Jordan was in flood and just rushing down, and the Old Testament says that when the feet of the, feet of the priests touched the water's edge, the water stopped flowing. Uh, and it goes on to say, a great distance away at a town called Adam. And that's a strange sort of miracle because what the writer is saying is the miracle didn't happen where the Israelites were, it happened somewhere else, it happened a great distance away and it tells you where at this town called Adam. Um, and so it happened not where they were and of course they then took advantage of this. And that prompts the question, especially if you're a scientist but also if you're not a scientist, what happened to this place called Adam? And what we've found in recent years is that this place called Adam is now called Darmius, the name has changed slightly, and this is uh, an earthquake region, and earthquake-induced mudslides, will the mudslide will slide across the River Jordan, and it will stop the flow typically for one to two days. And this was observed, I think, in 1911, and then in 18-something and 17-something, about every hundred years this happens, so an earthquake happens there. And the records peter out in about the 13th century. But it's been observed and recorded something like eight times. And so when the Old Testament says, you know, this is where this miracle happened, and when we know today, more recently, there's been this earthquake-induced mudslide, then this is the mechanism of that miracle. And so what makes it a miracle is the timing. It was just when the Israelites were there that the water stopped and they were able to cross. So scientists have no problem with that sort of miracle. But then there's a different sort of miracle, and maybe the resurrection is the sort of supreme example of this, where it seems that science cannot explain that. And so how do I, as a scientist and as someone who believes in the resurrection, how do I think of this? So let me just end by telling you a picture, I'll give you a little story, a sort of musical analogy. So let's assume there's a piano in this room, and someone's playing the piano, and uh, you go and stand behind him or her, and you watch her playing the piano, and she's got no music, and you just watch her hands on the keys. And you notice that every time she goes to play the key, that the note F, she plays F sharp. And if you know a bit of music, you'll think, ah, she's playing in the key of G, right? So in this music, there'll be a key signature at the end of each uh, line of music, and the key signature tells the, tells the, uh, the pianist to, write, to play F sharp instead of F. And in a sense, that's what scientists are trying to do when they look at the universe. They're looking at how the universe operates and trying to understand the rules by which the universe operates. But now let's, you can let's, let's consider you, you keep looking at this pianist and you notice that sometimes she doesn't play F sharp, she just plays F. And sometimes she might play B flat or A flat. And that's because the composer has introduced accidentals into the music. And because he's the composer, he's free to do this. Right, it's free to introduce these accidentals, but if he's, a, if he's a great composer, 
He doesn't do it capriciously, he does it because it makes better music. And um, I once tried this, you can try this. You go home and take out a piece of really great music with some accidentals in, and then you try playing it without the accidentals and with the accidentals, and you'll find the accidentals actually make the music come to life. They make a great music. And so if you think of God as a sort of master composer, then he isn't bound by the rules that is set up for the universe to operate in, and he's free to break his own rules. But if he does that, it has to make more sense rather than less sense. And so if Jesus really was the Son of God, then the resurrection makes more sense and not less sense. And that's how you find the early disciples describe it. So the day of Pentecost, just seven weeks after the crucifixion, Peter's talking to, to, to people, and he says that uh, death couldn't hold Jesus because he was a son of God. So the resurrection was something inevitable, not incredible. So I think if you're a scientist, as I am, I don't find difficulty in looking at miracles because they're either miracles of timing, in which no rules are broken, as it were, or else they're these uh, special miracles like the resurrection where God has accidentals, as it were, and he's the creator, so he can introduce accidentals just like a musical composer can. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.